<laughs> yeah, I, I was living in Cambridge during the pandemic. And it was like a few words of the and they, when they invaded my apartment, I lived up in a shasta. Yeah, with audio, I have no idea how to do now because he'll be moving, so I cannot attach this slow mic. This I cannot attach to him because he'll be moving around. Huh? Pick up the sound. No, this one will not pick up the sound. It only picks up from here. <laughs> So try to say something. Yeah, and so he will have to speak to the to the monk. <laughs> Just if you hear uh, on Zoom, I speak like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you very much for. Uh, we have to mute the Zoom so we don't hear um, the echo. Thank you for joining us today. Today, today we have very special guests, as you all know, Kalakant, His Grace Kalakanta Prabhu, uh, Global Ministry of Cow Protection Agriculture, visiting us in his American tour. So we're very pleased and honored to have him on site. So we'll just set up, we have a recording, live stream, presentation. So <laughs> everything is set up, I think, for now. So let's welcome Kantu to give us a wonderful talk in the feed the earth. So Hare Krishna, dear devotees, welcome. His Grace Kalakanta Prabhu here in Gitanagari Farm and Sanctuary. Very happy and honored to have him here as a Global Minister of Cow Protection and Agriculture. Today we're going to hear a talk on the top of the earth as part of the American tour that uh, His Grace Kalakanta Prabhu does uh, on the farms here in America. So let's welcome him with all our heartwarming welcoming. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Well, everyone, thank you so much. It's we can we can pick this. It's a pleasure to be here in Gitanagri, the legendary Gitanagri, where <coughs> Shiva Prabhupada had great plans. He had a plan to teach the whole world how to live off the land from this location. And for me, as a civic, a servant, trying to help him in whatever capacity I can in this mission, it is an honor to be here. I was really thrilled yesterday in the forest of Gitanagri, how much potential agroforestry holds, and it will develop during the presentation, the two matrices, matrices of abundance, the cows and the forest. And Gitanagri, both of them can be superimposed like Vrindavan. You have Krishna, the cows, and the forest. And this combination is the total matrix of abundance. So we're going to explore a little bit about this in this presentation. And I hope to give you an overview of what we have done over these last eight years and what we're about to do in the next four. And without saying anything else, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it is, you know, for anybody with this service, a great privilege. I'm really excited. There's so many new fronts 
the CSA and the, the, the creamery coming along, the forestry coming along, more people joining, more energy, synergy. Uh, that's, that's where the whole thing will happen. The economics of hub of education for this whole region on so many aspects. Prabhupada had the vision, we just have to try to run after that vision. And I'm sure your GBC, the Varanita Swami, he's holding the Varanita Swami, we work together in many places. He's very supportive too. Okay, so we'll start. Um, there are some people who are online, may join later. Please feel welcome also. Today I had a very transcendental experience. I went to give Shimad Bhagavatam class and only the Acharyas were present. It was a very mystical experience, you know? How to give a class for the Acharyas? So I was feeling humbled. And then Krishna sent one noble soul to sit and he was my a tutorial. I could talk to him and the class went well by his mercy. Uh, but I understand everybody was doing the work which I was talking about. So that's glorious. In the creamery, in the orchard, in the gardens. So later on at night when work is finished, you can always, if you like, listen again to that recording. So let's start. And I'll start by the opening. Uh, a humble opening in 2015. Uh, oh, first of all, for some of you who may not know me, I'm Kala Kanta Das. I'm from a family of farmers for four generations. My grandfather used to travel 800 kilometers on horseback to bring the best cows to his property. Am I audible at the back? Yeah. At the back, I'm okay. You can hear me? Good? Okay. Yes, my grandfather, Abilio, used to travel on horseback to get his best cows to get his herd. You can to present the book. Where is it presenting the book? Yes, okay. Thank you. The last bit. So, going back to my background, my father, as a young boy, was in the middle of semi arid Brazil, and his service is to feed the cows. Uh, guess what? He's feeding with cactus. That's the best he has. So, he has to take some of the thorns of those kind of, you know, the Mexican cactus, like the palm cactus. So they chop it, he serves to get it, chop it, feed the cows, then go. But as every cowherd man, they had his tricks, he trained the bullock cart, this bullock cart driven, to drive alone. He didn't have to do anything. You know, we're talking about eye, eye intelligence, AI intelligence. The bullock carts were perfect. They did exactly where he wanted to go, they just went. On the way, he'd jump off into the creamery, small creamery, they made cheeses. He'd grab a piece of cheese, run, hop on the cart again, and off he went with his piece of cheese in his bullock cart. So he was in this lifestyle, but his grandmother was a lady of great character. Uh, she thought he was a bit intelligent. Is it okay Does this disturb the light? No need, yeah? she wanted him to study and he said no i don't want to study it's not important i prefer to be here with my cows and that's what i want to do for life and she'll say no but just make an attempt he did and he got first place so that was his his problem but then she said oh you got such a nice place you should go he ended up in cambridge doing his phd then we went to india and that was a practical part of his thesis in the 80s. So I got to know these villages in India, which blew my mind up. My impression today of that village in Hyderabad, where we walked in, the village looked like more a big house. Everybody lived together. One was growing, one was sewing. The boys were carrying the, the cotton, and another was threading, another was painting, another was weaving, and another was selling. And they worked as one unit. And it was so peaceful that for me as a teenager, which is really thinking about life and excitement and literature and things, we didn't have internet at the time, so we read the books. It just, I forgot everything. There's a temple, which I, at the time, I didn't know what it was, but probably a, a demigod temple. But everybody was on that lifestyle. And 
it created a deep impression. So that started my thinking process about more peaceful places to be. Uh, so I came to ISCA and joined and finally went to my airport to educate my, my daughters and the GBC kind of recruiting me. Somehow they recruited this young man and asked me to be a global minister in 2015. So here we come to this picture. And I was alone and young and, <clears throat> well, not so young, middle age. Uh, and I didn't know how to do this. So the first static was, let's replicate five conference cycle. We were here seven years ago. It was happening in Europe. Shiva Ram Swami, Shamasone Prabhu started it. And I said, this is mar marvelous. It's a family mood. Everybody comes together. We bring experts. We learn. It's an excellent venue. So we did it. So I was here in 2016 with the first North American conference. Then we went to Brazil, the first South American farm conference. Then we went to Italy, the eighth European farm conference. With the idea to visit everybody, develop some systems. With the whole thing was to develop a network which would then teach regenerative agriculture and ethical therapy. So the first eight years was building the farm conferences, building the network to educate. That's where we are now. This is 2023. We have four years. The GBC body has accepted the plan. Uh, we had a little black cap, okay. Uh, to the ministry now, drive all its energy into education. And that's what we're trying to launch. Feed the Earth is a series of courses, uh, apprenticeship courses online, which drives the people to the on site training like a master. You want to be somebody good in primary? Get an agri over there. Or you want to do some, some, somewhat in forestry? You have New Vraja down. You have different places which have it works with that. You want to be good with breeding? Let's go to Mayapur. One gentleman I'm going to show his work, Brahma Gopa. So you have great teachers all over, but there's no hub. So you can see all of them and tap into a course and go there. So that's what we're building. Uh, then Gopal, I'll ask you to come out of this, of this, and come to this great. Okay, so the first concept I want to introduce to all of you is that we're going to phase of digital transhumanism. Has anybody heard about that? So what does that sound like? What, what comes to your mind when you think about that? Uh, atheistic, demonic, dystopia. <laughs> That's a good description. But what does it, what is trying to attempt? Uh, anybody, what is trying to achieve? Uploading your soul into the, into the matrix. Right, that's a very nice description. In other words, transcending through technology, transcending human limits through technology. And if you go into this cell of digital transhumanism, you see that one is we're trying to really get artificial intelligence. Will robots rule, robots rule the world? You, Robert, rule the world. That's a big question in people's mind, right? And, and that whole discussion has a background. So let's go to the background. The background of it is really like, first it was about the machinery. We thought, yes, machinery is going to change the world. Then exploring the deep minerals and everything. Then the atomic energy came about in the 60s, late 60s, and now we are in the virtual idea. Yeah, you are a number somewhere. Matrix you're talking about. Here you are. <laughs> right? Okay, let's go out of this. Uh, in biotech, if we go, we're really talking about, you know, all this transformation of genetics, all this, you know, GMOs and experiences with the hope that one day we'll be able to create life. Okay, let's go back. And finally, agriculture. Isn't it similar? Look at the war, look at agriculture. Can you see a similarity here? Actually, it was designed. Gentleman, who looks like the, you know those cartoons where you have the, the bad guy? Doesn't he look like him? He's, he's really big. And he was basically looking at all the residues from the war through here. All the chemicals into uh, your pesticides, your herbicides, all the nutrients urea that is used somewhat there to come here. 
So he's just trying to have a market for his leftovers of the war. And there you start with agriculture war. We say conventionalism, agriculture war. You have to kill the past. You have to kill everybody to be, to be alive. Everybody must be an army man, complete same height, same maturity. That's part of what digital transhumanism is trying you want to overcome nature and it's through technology. And that has proved to be a big flaw. Global warming, water table problems, so many problems, uh, food chain disruptions, the farmers that live in their place, then you have, you can't just run up and pick. So the whole purpose of this was not to put machinery. It was to overcome the limits of human nature out again by redefining human. And that's what it's come to be. I was in Atlanta. I could not take a taxi with cash. Cash is king, right? You have the cash, you have everything. Cash is not the king. I was there. I didn't have a credit card. Hey, I don't know nobody here. Because my credit card had a little problem in Brazil. I couldn't fix it. But I had the money. I couldn't catch a taxi. There's no taxi around. How do we get it? So our power to be in control, even of money, is getting far. Even of money. Okay, now money is already illusion. It's only paper. Now, our power to build is getting distance. Our power to grow food is getting distance. Our power to raise our children is getting distance. Everything is being very much being taken from your control and put into systems, into machines, into, you know, I was just thinking for today's morning class, but I could have a recording of the class, so I think I just play. <laughs> so, this mentality is scary because what happens when you have human interaction is warmth. And there's a lot which happens there. Let's go, let's go in analog. Now, analog transhumanism, that's what we are. Let's go there. See, this is it. It's yagya, it's warmth, it's understanding of nature. What is the relationship between nature and its elements? And here we are. Any activity not done for Vishnu will bind you. And sacrifice for them? You see, that's what it says. And it was not done for Vishnu, it will definitely bind you. Isn't this good? I'm talking about the concrete is depicted in those uh Indo Valley civilization collection in the museums, you see them. That old, oh, this breed, stable breed. Let's go here to Shiro Prabhupada, what does it say? Well, Shiro Prabhupada being, brings first the Dharma element when you, you know, oh, go back once. I want to say this. Who can read this for me? Self protection leads to the Mika culture, which leads towards God consciousness. And thus, perfection of human civilization is achieved. Prabhupada Srimad Bhagavatam. Because Prabhupada in the Bhagavatam, which is supposed to be literature to guide us, he is very bold in saying that. He's connecting cow protection to civilization. Let's go to Dharma. Well, here it is. You have your cows, and you're bathing the deities, and the same milk is feeding the Brahman, who's guiding the society. There you go. That's the picture. This Brahman has enough intelligence to guide the whole society. He's an intellectual. This milk, if it's grass-fed, that is the food. And the more it is grass-fed, the more DHA, which is 60% or 40 to 60, he's got the data, of your mass of the cortex. So there's a connection between this and this, and Prabhupada speaks about it, and a correlation between milk and the Brahminical. And the Brahminical and civilization. So when Prabhupada is saying cow protect, it's not a sentiment, let's keep some animals and protect civilization. He's talking about a bigger picture. And that's what I want to be thinking about. Okay. And of course, sorry, let's go back down once. I mentioned in class the milk is the liquid form of Dharma 117.3. That's correct. That's not. Uh, let's go to Ghee. He is, he is Mahabharata. If you do a sacrifice without ghee, it's not considered a sacrifice. Go out and go to the soil. 
Okay, now here is what we're talking here today. So, Sir Albert Howard, I make a joke. Maybe you have heard it. He had two good qualities. He was British, humble, a very rare combination. <laughs> because he was humble, because he was humble, he came to teach the primitive Indian guys how to farm. He's going to come walk in India and say, hey, I'm British Empire representative. I'm coming with John Deere, technology, NPK, the whole package. The productivity he got in India was one third of what Indian primitive people were getting. So he said, I can't teach them that. So he walked back and started research. And what he found is that biomass management was so incredible with the cow dung that everything was really fertile around the villages. It was a micromanaged system. Every household was doing it. So when you put 2,000 households with tons of cow dung being applied to the soil, instead of being one big machine and one big loader, every house had a little basket and a wife and a husband working together, putting in the soil. We see this in Michael, right? Not that still today, when she was there with her husband, we had the privilege of riding a bullock cart from Mayapur to Jagannath Mandi. Believe me, if you're ever in Mayapur, beg the farm manager to let you do this. It's so pacifying. The pace of the bull and the, and the japa pace, they just go like, especially holy down. And not only that, your chakras kind of become peaceful. You can think, you can talk. Yes, I get some nods here. Uh, we were there in this ride. So we had four couples from four different parts of the world. North America, Ukraine, Russia, Brazil, others. So what he was he saying? The health of the soil, plant, animal, and human is one and indivisible. That's something we must understand. Just yesterday, yesterday we, we oh, before yesterday, yesterday? The day before, when you were when I arrived, we met our good old friend for many years, Sam and his son. And he was saying, I only worry about what's under the soil. Because my milk is better, the herd is more his different quality of health, and I get abundant. So much so that he buys his feed, right? And we have spoken about it. He can afford to buy his feed because I'm what I'm getting so abundant that I don't buy. But I prefer to give the help. So he's tapping into Howard's discoveries. And all he's doing is passion management. That's all he's doing. It's worthwhile visiting, very close by. So Howard was the father of organic farming, and that led to regenerative. Everybody will accept him as a father. That's the fun. Score that, you know. Okay. Nature. What happens when you leave a building here for 10 years. It was the earth reclaims it, right? This is a temple of a few thousand years, which was completely broken by the forest. So there's something in nature, an idea to regenerate itself. Okay, I wanted to point this out. Let's go. And I want really to go to this part, which is the part. So, pause. Have you ever heard about the natural law? Prabhupada speaking about the natural law in his books. Anybody? <laughs> I'm surveying. Yes? Give me something more. <laughs> he, he quotes the natural law many places. And he's talking about how the planet regenerates. He says the natural law would regenerate. And he talks of Dharma, he speaks of the natural law. He brings that again and again. The natural law is some law which kind of rules the planet, rules the earth. He talks about the forest, protecting the forest. You recall something? Uh, I was just gonna say, that's Dharma means law. Yes. So he is tapping into that concept of Dharma and the natural law. And it comes from life. But life comes from life. Okay, that's a huge one. Life comes from life is the analog transhumanism. Life comes from life, and to be able to transcend this material life, you need that transcendental aspect to it, which is the sacrifice, which is the Buddha, which is the knowledge, which is the self-realization. So life comes from life. That's, that's definitely the natural. 
Well, now, if we go to the forest, that's what I wanted to focus today. This is a forest. It starts as a grass. It's bushy. Five years, it's getting like a little growth. Okay, it's going through its, it's called its colonization period. And then there's accumulation period where more energy is being accumulated here, here, and here. You see the difference here. And then it gets to a climax. That's the forest. The forest is in balance, homeostasis. So nature works from simple to complex. How does nature work? Simple to complex. I didn't hear you. Simple, simple to complex. complex. You're not convinced. Simple, simple to complex. complex. Yes. How does contemporary war agriculture work? Uh, complex to destruction. Complex to simple. We cut the forest and we put the grass. We isn't it corn? So the system starts with the grass and it progresses to a forest. We cut the forest and we put the grass. Right? So we are going against the grain of nature. Therefore, all the consolidated life here diminishes over time. Your soil fertility diminishes, and then you say, hey, soil is less, so you have to put something from outside. What's better than some formula? Just drop it by airplane. You know, so the idea is when you don't allow life to manifest itself, life comes from life, you get poverty. So we're going to explore that. Let's talk about energy. Energy. Energy-wise, when you use technology in your farming, to get 10% surplus in your system as a, as a whole, you have to put in 70 to 75% energy. Inputs, gasoline, petrol, everything. If you take a natural system with a near 3%, you get the 10%, to 15%. That means the whole, the system itself is feeding itself. So if you have a forest and you cut the forest and you let it do your fertilizers, that fertilizer is energy which will be retained and kept in the system, and that's when you get it 10 to 15 percent. You put your nitrogen today, three days later, it's washed. So you lost a lot of energy. Your heavy machinery is losing petrol to operate, you're losing energy. You have to input, 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 and you're losing energy. So, therefore, the 10% that you want to increase in your system requires so much energy. And that's why so much subsidies and so to work on it because we have forgotten that life comes from life and you need a living soil to have abundance let's go to the next one next slide the next one is community i love this one i'm going to say a bold statement bold statement is we so far have not succeeded oh we have an honorable guest in the audience hi gentlemen so happy to see you here. We we'll put a special chair for you in the front. But <laughs> you're always taking a humble position. Uh, community and the bold statement is: we have not yet succeeded in Vanasha because we have ignored community. And the first community we have ignored is what not seen under the soil. The microbiological community. This community is so complex and beautiful and intricate and cooperative that there is systems which scientists are starting to understand that if there is a lack of potassium here, by connections, these roots will understand and translocate to the different chains of bacteria, fungi there. So the forest reached homeostasis as a unit. The forest is looking for homeostasis as a whole community. And it's being run by a few laws, which we'll look at it very shortly. So the first real understanding for us to be abundant is community, and it starts below the soil. That's our foundation. Just like we don't see the foundation of this building, but it's here. Have you ever thought how many feet down it goes under? So we're here on the first floor, feeling very comfortable and safe. So everything which is here is a result of this. Therefore, my statement, the forest is one matrix of abundance. 
And we have to really pay attention to this because if we do, abundance is something we all want. And when you have, you can give. If you don't have, it's hard to give. Like here in town, working hard, shifts, have to load different places, pay insurance, pay everything. It's hard to give because you're barely making. But if you have an abundance, like you've got 5,000 pumpkins, what's the first thing that crosses your mind? Distribute. To distribute. You don't want to get them to go back. You sell what you can, but whatever you can't, you want to give to it. Please, please. You got it. And you feel that nature give again. So therefore, you can give. You can be a giver. Our philosophy is to be a giver. We give knowledge. A giver. Here, let's go. So, this is an important aspect. Farming systems. So, we are progressing to understand which farming systems understand community of the microbiological world. One is the agroforestry syntropic movement in Brazil, started by Ernest. He understood that if he prunes the trees and put enough biodiversity in the different stratas, he will be able to feed the soil. So he does not only plant crops for us, he plants crops for us, for the soil, for everybody. So the whole system is imitating the system of forest. In the middle is a corridor. You can put grains, you can put grass, you can put so many things. And this corridor, if it's like a pasture management site, the cows gradually go as soon as the trees are big enough so they won't eat them. And they will just develop this by fertilizing very strongly. And then the next season you come with grains, and then the next season you come with pasture, and the next season you come with grains. So you have here your maple syrup, your walnuts, your apples, and here you have your cows. So you can just imagine on the hillside, you could have contours of trees and pasture land. So all becomes usable. And you have your forestry plus your cows in the forest. Something to look out for. Now you have the traditional Indian system of rice. It's a bit monocrop, and everybody's saying, how come rice is planted for thousands of years and still is fertile? Anybody has a clue? I'm going to pick this up right from the back. You have a clue? No clue. Not yet? Why is rice fertile even though they plant again and again and again and again and again over thousands of years? Any idea? Is it because of the water? Because of the water. You have, you're getting warm. You're getting warm. Cattle? The cow dung also, you see the cow dung is being passed here. Yes. Oh, the cow dung, you see, he's not compacting the soil. That's another issue. He is very lightly stepping. If you're going to put machinery here, wet soil, your tendency is to smash that soil, finish it. So, cow dung, water. They don't disturb the soil. That's a good idea. Usually, when you my English is not enough to explain, but I have heard that when you in modern age they disturb the soil, they just do it like this, you know. When you plow, yes, invert, and, and they destroy their uh, micro micro life, like the habitat, yeah, and, 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 and then uh, they just die and no, no, living in that soil to produce. Uh, Something like humans, fertility, different uh, microorganisms. Yes, please. Go ahead. You want yeah. to say something? Yeah. 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 You want to say something too? Yes. So, there are lots of the, those uh, little living entities, and when they disturb the soil, they die, and that's why it's not so. It's just like you build get an agri. Next season, we wipe it over and say, let's build it again. A new welcome center, a new temple, a new. So, because it's been done for so long, we think, yes, that's the only way to go. But the no till movement is saying, hey, wait a second, there are ways you can disturb less soil and be more successful. Let's look at that. Let's investigate that with science, not just sentiment, science. So, this system has been going for thousands of years. And they seem to be sustainable. Actually, when I grew rice in India, because I was fed up with and people just say, Yeah, you talk about where's your where is your plot? We rented a plot and we planted the rice. Boy, what a good feeling. 
You see, in India, you have a credit card, which is your life. If that credit card breaks, you don't have money, you don't need to stay. So it's like God. Like, shall I go put you every day for the car? Please stay. Don't go there. Whoever lived there knows what I'm talking about. So we decided to plant rice. And in my veranda, there are five bags of rice, 250 kgs. Boy, I feel so secure next to that bags of rice. So even if there's a crisis, I can eat rice. I grow in the subject. So that experience actually is one of changes. Having it been like this, you feel the security the grains give, the key give. Prabhupada says that's real well. When you feel it, that's it. We can talk about it, can, but when you really have it and you're in a situation of dependence, you can't just go around. I, I only had the car. I mean, it didn't work. I had to lend money from somebody, but how can I pay? Anyhow. So that's one. And then you have this other system here. You can click on it, actually. Technology has itself. So this is the traditional system, if you think about it. Krishna, Nanda Maharaj, going to the forest, raising cows. And they have huge herds which trample and hooked. And they were moving to different areas, different grazing lands. And that was also very sustainable until one problem happened. Anybody has a clue? What was the problem in the Indian grazing system? Deforestation. Deforestation, yes, that is a big problem. Anybody else? From New Zealand, get some ideas. Why was the Indian system of grazing declined? Fencing? In India, they don't have much fencing. They have encroaching, which is not at all. The real estate starts to encroach and claim the common land. So that's it's a great problem. It's a great problem. There's one problem. People move to the city for the moment because of the Yes, and the, the, the underlying thing is the village stopped to be one minute. Everybody had their nuclear little space. Now, if this grazing belongs to a whole group which understands unit, they graze together. But if this now is like a divided groups, how will I manage their common ground? Fights, disputes, this group does this. You know, so the whole concept of a unit collapse and then the grazing land collapse. But this system was very sustainable. The cows were so healthy, the old people and young people went with the cows which are retired, and the productive animals were taking care of the farmers and the cows, the farmers, that's how they live. That's how Prabhupada writes a lot of the books. But that unit was the key point which was broken, and from that unit, the whole system. Wow. So that system, but there are new systems called the holistic pasture management, which are becoming that. We just saw some. This side here is a really good one. Should be grass fed, very stout animals, even the deeper. Very happy. Let's go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Okay, and finally, education. So, this is my last slide. What we're trying to do is what regenerative agriculture proposes. And we start here by rethinking the system. Click here, please. One. Boom. Design. We need to design. We need to understand zoning, where we are at the temple, where we put the vegetables, everything in relation to people and energy and logistics. So permaculture does that. It thinks of your farm as a system. And then when you put your forestry more, more far away, your wire, you know, everything has zones. So that's one interesting contribution. And I'll add Vastu. Because when you have a good Vastu, all the subtle energies are channeled directly. Fire stands in the south and east. It will not move. It stands there. So the different directions relate to different elements. And when we understand them, energy flows a lot. A lot better. Many farms are missing and failed with other things. You walk in, you make a diagram, just see. One example is uh, this from Australia. Ajita Prabhu was here uh, with us in 19. And he was saying that his farm was a mess uh, in terms of debt, the boats, the boat is fighting, all kinds of problems. And there was a south slope 
a, a slope going to the south, very deep. And he did Vastu and said, build a wall. Okay, so he started building. He said, when, when the wall was one foot high, they zeroed the depths. By the time the wall got to about this high, how many feet took it? Like five foot, six foot, five, six foot. Money started to come, and somebody says, I want to make a restaurant. And the restaurant started very successfully. Today, the restaurant makes a million dollars a year. His retreat system makes a million dollars. He makes tons of money, and he does not depend on donations. His policy is no donations, it's production. So Ajit is doing retreats and things like this, and Krishna Village is a great concept. That's how I brought him here to explore the volunteer idea. And I see you have a little place there coming up. I just drove by with a little place for tents. It's very nice. Um, uh, okay, so that's Sony. Okay, so rethinking. Let's go back. Then there is minimize soil disturbance. We need to do that. The less we disturb the soil, the more we respect community down there, the more we create structure in the soil, we favor microorganism activity, we have more abundance really. Then we must increase diversity. That's a huge problem. Everybody's planting around here in monocrop. It's intense, but it's one. Can you imagine if everybody ate the same thing in this room, drove the same, you know, everything becomes monolithic. We need, so yeah, go ahead, that's good. So that's what it looks like. This is direct planting system. They plant the corn, they cut it, replant it on top of the corn uh, stalks, and now the new corn is there. So the soil is not disturbed and it's covered. Mulching, really important practice. Uh, this is something Brazil is doing big scale. I'm talking millions of hectares, not just small little thing. And then we have keep the soil covered. We covered. We have. Maintain roots year round, perennials. The more you have perennials, the best. And finally, last number six, click on number six for me. This is what the Brazilian is doing, right? They have eucalyptus, eucalyptus, grass, and cows for a purpose that's not worth mentioning. But the system itself, we can look at it. It is monocrop, but the cows have shade. It's much better than an open, just pasture land. So they, are, they increase their productivity in all systems. There's a little cooperation. But I think this is just like a first step. This is more like a syntropic attempt. Mombasa grass for the cattle, and here's your trees with bananas, fruit trees, cassava, cocoa, acai, and all the tropicals. Here it could be walnuts, apples, uh, maple syrup, and woods, cedars, and different varieties of herbs Additional tincture would be you know, flowers for, for the bees. And you could have bees in the system. So it's a whole system design where it's not only one thing, but you have many things going on. And this is a beautiful education model. People who come from universities, from America, just to see you. There's no question since you're in the Amish state, how much money do the Amish make every year just of tourism? A lot. How much a lot? Give a number. You mean as a whole community of Amish? Yeah, the whole community of Amish. Amish. In North America. In North America. Yeah. What do they make in tourism? Give a number. Billion. Half a billion. Half a billion. One? One billion. Okay. They're very lucky with anybody else. Come on, give a guess. You came from Brazil. How much do the Amish people make? <laughs> Ten million. 50. 15 million yeah. at the back 20 million check on it two million dollars two billion talking the crop cost no we're talking about how much do they generate through the activities uh you're asking how much they make from tourism people want to see them just because they're different they don't make anything zero. Okay, he's making his bidding zero. What do you say? Are you volunteering here? Uh, Ten million at the back. The farmers. All, all the farmers. Yeah. Twenty million. Twenty million. Per month is it? Ten fifteen million. This side from New Zealand. Any guess? Twenty million. 
How much? 50 million. Uh, someone won a prize today. They got a figure. Who got the prize? Two billion dollars every year. Just from tourism. People want to see why they're so different. Actually, America has two icons. Disney, you have heard about Disney, right? And then in the American tourism agencies, the second biggest attraction in America to be exactly what they are. Wearing their clothes, driving their boogies, and you get the children in one classroom, living off the land whenever possible. Because people want something which is original. There's not nothing original anymore. Everything's like the same. You go to the airport in here, the airport in Africa, and in the South one. It's you don't know which airport am I? They want something original, it has some color, flavor, interaction. So two billion. So you can just imagine the market. It's, you know, it's enormous. People coming here to see Hare Krishnas with forestry and agroforestry and maple syrup and honey and, and, and ahimsa dairy. And who are these people want to go there? And all of their operation is decentralized. That's very important. So small is efficient. Small is beautiful, she might have said. Right? So I think that was my last slide. Our foundational course. This is my last one. It's this is the cycle, 23, 27. I'm doing my first tour after the pandemic, my first tour. And this tour is to glean what we have already got in our institution and outside to kind of offer the modules. You saw me in? We have the TCKC. Any idea what that is? TCKC. It's a course. Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness. Teaching something Krishna consciousness. All right. Good reading. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Who can guess what TCKC would be? Something you really have a lot to teach you. You don't have a non-profit with that name. Never. Taking care of Krishna scouts. So it used to be Goshala Manager's Court, but Goshala Manager, very few people be interested in Goshala Manager's Court. So taking care of Christian Scouts is a general course. Uh, Shetra Swami wrote a book called Cow Can Human Ethics. A very nice book. He's going to be part of this. Uh, we invited the Bhagavad Swami to be part of this. Why it's important and the practices which follow. That's what we're looking for. That's we're here. Some of the criminal practice, perhaps you can have it all out. Anybody wants to learn more, come to you. And they, they become a friendship of the Gitarani, a friendship of my, a friendship of New Lord. So that's what we're trying to attack in one platform. Next one. Then the next one is community dynamics. Uh, community dynamics is very important because, after all, if we fight, we're together and we fight, the whole thing just falls apart. So we have a career from who's been looking for community dynamics here in this room many years. What we're trying to do is what sticks people together? I'm going to make an experiment. Uh, I forgot your name. You're volunteering here. Yeah. Kira? Kira, what's one thing you love to do with people? What's anything you like to do, any normal activity you like to do, talking to people. You're having a party in your house with your best friends. How do we feel? Good. Uh, let's have another volunteer. Uh, Relative, what do you like to do with people? Sing. Sing. You're there, your friends are singing, maybe I don't know how to sing, we're playing the piano with you. How do you feel? This is called social glue. Every time you feel like that, your social glue bank account increases. And that social glue allows you to make a sacrifice for a friend. Hey, Rivati Mataji, I need your help today. Sure, I'll come over. Prabhu, I'm running late, the Pujari, something happened, can you come? Sure. Because the social glue account exists. If you remove your social glue account, it's like removing your skin, and then your, your flesh, and then your fat, and then you're in the ball. How does it feel when someone hits you in the bone? 
I never want to go back to this community forever <laughs> because the person was hit in the bone. There's no social glue. Bank account. So the social glue is, is met by many community dynamics technologies. Robert Hall is in Gen, Global Co-Village Network. He's running 10,000 eco villages affiliated to his institution, and they talk about regenerative intentional communities. So his main topic, he'll be a teacher, how do we build so what are some of the common uh, technologies for group that community dynamics that you can incorporate? How can we increase synergy? Ownership, all of this stuff. So that's one of the teachers we're trying to bring more of East Coast devotees here on board. I'm sure Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj had a lot to say on that. He has books, in it. does he? We could connect to that part. And finally, systems of abundance is the third line and i'm spearheading and i'm bringing in more specialists to talk about agroforestry regenerative agriculture and how to look at the property in the middle so in a nutshell that's the presentation of the tour and if we have a little conversation or debate we're very happy to answer to be corrected if you want to correct me we live to be corrected says one of our gurus Vashishka Prabhu. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Hare Krishna. Turn the light down. Yes, you can turn the light up. Who's controlling the light? Mother Parijat is controlling anything that comes up on her knee. <laughs> so that's one of the qualities of social good. Whenever there's a need, Mataji, and we do it, it we deposit in the bank. So it is recording our project. Whenever modern items and chapters, not going to implement some of the chapters. So I'm saying, try to do the classic with what is the ideal of the same level. Not disturb the side so much. Each year, you know, um, we turned up, plant one kind of crop, keep growing soil, so do balance it with what, what the idea is. So, good. He, well, I'll try to say what he said. Say, okay, so we want to do this, and if you're not using the tractor, how do you balance over years this fertility? Yeah. yeah? So the answer is simple. There must be a trans gradual transition, in the minute, uh, reducing machinery. It's a gradual transition. If you want to step in from today, only manual bullock carts, you operation just stop. And then the whole thing is finished. So the idea probably not against machines. He was against unemployment. He wanted everybody to have an engagement. And his main point is, you have to produce it, that he wanted, and then you have to phase it out. You know, like in New Russia, the Hungary, as I mentioned today in the class, they spend 600,000 euros to make a bullock house, a powerhouse. The turbine is something which is, well, perhaps as, as wide as this hall, and the four bulls are going around and they turn the shaft, which goes into PTO, and they have so many machineries. They have a woodcutter, a grain processor, and they could put any machine in there because the RPM is, is fast enough. So all from four bulls, they can operate a whole industrial barn, and that's being showcased. That's the next step of cow protection, engaging the oxen. We really need to engage the oxen, and they're powerful. They're not lazy. They are happy to work. Can you imagine yourself in your room, just looking at TV, sitting down, eating, sitting down? How do you feel? Come on, be honest. You see, they want, they want action. They want a purpose in life. So if they're working, they're, they're very happy. They get strong and they have a certain, you know, have you ever seen a pair of boobs? One is the leader and he looks down on the other and says, hey, you keep your game up, otherwise, yeah. And they are, they are there. 
So that's life for them. That's just like interaction with humans and certain humans. So they invested to show that. So it's a gravity process. They have a tractor, gigantic tractor, the best one you get, four wheels on. But they're trying to reduce it. And that's what, is that okay? Another comment, question from the back. A last question. Right. Thank you, Professor. See, it's a hard now, just hold on a minute. When was a farmer giving so much spotlights? This is a historical moment. Should have a photo. A farmer with three microphones. Wait a minute, what's going on? It's you're, just because you're here, Um I'm I'm wondering what's the um yeah, why why are farm communities like agriculture is it so stressed as a kind of building block for Varnash and Dharma? Okay, why is cow protection and cow so stressed as a building block for Varnashram? Very good question. Thank you for your question. And it's a question which in itself could be a one week seminar. So I'll try to give you a short answer as you have plenty of time. And your answer is quite simple. Uh, is Varnashram dependent on the rural setting? And the answer is no. If you're a Vaisha and you go to New York, all of a sudden, hey, I lost my Vaisha quality. Now I'm something else. No, you continue to have that external nature. Whatever you have, your conditioned nature continues. But in the rural environment, it's much easier to work it out. Point one. Point two, if you think about the abundance of the underworld community, that abundance will reflect outside. How do you build that in a city? The jobs and work shifts, it's very hard for people to live, to pay the bills, to educate the children, create nice moments and spiritual lives. You have to have those little times. You run into the temple, chant something, run to your job, go back. It's not like you could be here on an oscillation. Uh, on a weekday, you could also do the same. And it's a luxury. You decide, okay, we'll take one hour, we'll discuss about it. In a city environment, you can do it. You have to ask permission to 50 companies. Hey, can you? Let your employee have one hour extra free, and it's a big hassle. So the rural environment allows the natural economy. And Prabhupada was so smart, as he's saying, grow your food. So all the local movement, local economy, carbon footprint, blah, 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 blah. He tackled it. Build your own house. All the mortgages and complications of the other system is tackled. Take care of cows. All your protein, brahminical nutrients is taken care of, plus your environmental issues is taken care of. Protect your forest and you have honey. Ha. Here's South a huge problem. It solves your economical problems. Then you have a house, you have a place to serve. You can go to New York sometimes. Is that really great? So then what are you going to do in New York? Go around roughly. What are you going to do there? You know, here you have all this environment and nature. We had the two preachers from New York, our good friend, fundamental He said, Wow, nature. They feel relieved. They feel excited with the mission, but stressed with the pressure of urban everything, urban, you know, the amount of electronic waves you're being bombarded every second just messes up your chakras. Yeah. Do you understand? So now your second question could have been, why is it that I own a farm and I'm not getting all that free time, that nature experience, I'm getting hard work and running around? Why is that? That's a genuine question. It was made to Shiva Ramaswamy by Hunter Prabhu. All right. We read that Prabhupada says, go to a farm, farm two months, and the rest is yours. And it's not experience this here. <laughs> Any similarity for you here? You like a lot of free time to hang around, go to the lake, yeah? Not really. Why not? The answer is very simple. Because what you need to survive here, you can get into money. But to run the mission, you need a lot more. So you're, you're investing your free time into further development. That's what you're doing. But if it's going to eat, sleep, and, and be here chanting two months, you're done. 
you do your grains, you do your vegetables, you can them, put in a stock, do your logging. Yes. Okay, so I don't have an experience ever. <laughs> See, you, you're in a farmer's spotlight, get used to fame. So, you know, taking care of animals, you can't neglect. You know, taking care of plants, you can't neglect. So how would it ever be two months? It might be that it doesn't have to be so intensive, 12 hour days like the devotees are working, but it seems like it requires, you know, steady attention all along. It becomes a lifestyle. So I don't even understand this idea of two months and when you do something else. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, I'll elaborate. Hope I can satisfy you. Uh... How many residents in Kitanagari Mataji? What is that? 20. Uh, am I on the farm? 60 total. In the farm, 20. How much dairy do you consume a day on 20 people? You make it in the middle of the day. You consume like a liter? So you're looking like 10 liters a day? 10 liters a lot. I mean, for, for 20 people, 10 liters is very abundant. You could have two days. How much? I just one cup. So that would be more. Okay, so one liter for four people, five liters. Okay, five liters you need. Okay, if you do five into 30, means. How much is 5 into 365 to make it easy? With my partition? Okay. You are very on total of you. That's your work. So, first of all. Okay, so, okay, 10 is easier. 10 into 365 means 3,600. 365. 3,630. 356. 356. Okay. 3,500 liters a year. Okay. Uh, how much does one cow produce? Gallons, say gallons. A day. A one cow. Yeah. Three gallons, right? Okay, three, let's say three gallons. Okay, three gallons would be 12 liters. Let's put 10 liters, make it easy, right? So if it's 10 liters, okay, you need one cow because you, you consume 10 liters. So with one cow, the 20 people living here are happy. How much work is one cow? But for my father, it was his pastime. He fed him in the morning, put her to graze a little bit, came back. Now, you're doing 20 cows, you're doing 40,000 liters, that's the expansion of the mission I'm talking about. You feed in the neighborhood, that's the expansion of the mission. But if the neighborhood is working with you... But my point is, even your father, he didn't do it for two months and he'd go away. He might have only done two hours no. a day, but he did for two hours a day all year round. Because a farmer, he doesn't really think, I'll do two months and go to Miami Beach. No, he thinks, I'll do two months of my grains, and then I live my life, which is taking care of my cow, and then I go there to see the little thing on the farm. But he's not really working since his lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. All right? So for him, it's not worth taking care of one cow, milking one cow for 10 liters. It's just like a little pleasurable thing. Is it? He took to his mother, it is that. So think about grains, think about vegetables, think about Right, so it's not much, but because we are expanding the mission, Gita Nagar is serving the purpose of delivering Ahimsa there to so many temples and people, then there's so much work. Then we need a lot more people for the mission to run totally. So that's why we don't get that a lot of free time because we're reinvesting, reinvesting in the mission. Okay, but our friend, remember our friend we just visited him. It's cool. He sits on the garden. He reads his, his book. He's maintaining his natural farming. He's almost a spontaneous farming, right? So it's a lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you spoke about so many wonderful things, how 
you know, successful farms work. You spoke about Vastu, you spoke about permaculture, you spoke about, you know, so many things. So we as a farm are trying to be practical and we would love to know, you know, where to start out of all of those great things that you mentioned. Uh, what can we implement sooner and later to have same or even better results in Thank our you. environment. Thank you for the question. I've been contemplating a lot for the last day, and I see how much the Tonagri has done, accomplished, how much it has evolved. And if I was supposed to give a like, uh, recommendation at the end of my visit, which is coming to that, um, I would say feed the earth. Feed the earth meaning, let's look at passion management. Tall grasses which you trample like our friendliness, let them live with from here. What does PASA have? What does the MCNRCS have? What does USA has? Does Brazil have anything that could bring it in? Who is doing something great with that that you could bring it in and make a small experiment? We test it out one year, we check it out. Seems to work. We can do five. Great. So for the cows, I think that would be a great thing. For the forestry, I'll make the forestry plot. Which are your prominent trees? Like we started yesterday, the gentleman was in, you know, our class was really like, oh my God, you got a sugar, what is that, a sugar hub? What's it called? Sugar bush. Sugar bush. He's a sugar bush. <laughs> and he was identifying, and then he was into walnut syrup, and his mind just blew off, but nobody has this many walnuts. We cut them down. So you could say walnut is triple. They say, I'll just do walnut. <laughs> so walnut and syrups is one, but it could go into flowers for the bees. You could have bees in the forest. You could have terraces in the forest. So where to start? Small experiments. At least opening the mental space. Okay, we want to know this. And let's see how much money in reality we make from this. How viable it is. Can we do the logistics, the manpower? If possible, and you increase organically. And that's what all the farmers do. They don't start a crop from nowhere. They try to touch it out, it works, they do a little more, and gradually they implement it. Because you also mentioned that the tourism is a big one. So if you do something, even if it's small, but if it's actually very interesting, it just immediately attracts the attention of Absolutely. students or visitors Absolutely. who will bring money in also. Krishna Village makes $1 million, not something to, to throw it away, right? From this, yoga courses, you already have the space. All you need is a good yoga teacher who wants to, to be with you, or a few teachers, different courses, and then you integrate sustainability courses. You take them on a forest tour, on a trail, you explain this herb is this, we make pinches from here, this is how, why we use this. So the whole system becomes a holistic big system that they buy in, and Krishna, Radha Damodar, is right in the center. So they don't have to be introduced to Radha Moda first, but whenever they're ready, Radha Moda is there for them. So the tourism ends into spiritual upliftment. But it starts with something they can relate to, nature, pollution, carbon footprint. You have the answers. You have just have a new uh, solar car, which is not a very cheap thing, but people appreciate and they'll say, hey, you really think of your money. So through that, you can attract some people who want to invest here, government agencies. I just saw your your fence here could be recovered. The forestry could be inside of that. All different species, you know, like ginseng, and different things can go there. And that's your future plant. Planting your future maple syrup, planting your future one. So all of that goes into a strategic level which now designs when it's implemented. But if the plan is ready, yeah. all you need is the person. When someone like the Chan plants, it's good. Is that all right? Good. Any more comments, questions, corrections? Yes. No, the weather does change over time. So the months that we usually get a lot of rains, we don't have them anymore. Excepting for the hurricane season, we don't get a lot of rains. 
So I'm thinking, I was looking, should we have been more catchment areas? For example, we have paved so much of the where we use so that you don't have much water going on the ground. So maybe we need to, you know, have even more storage, so to speak. That's a great point. And that's what Mark Shepard is doing in Oscar for a farm, put some farm. He's putting hugels and he's putting barriers, channeling the water to strategic white points, which holds water. Because we just take for granted that water will be always there. But you see, you have all this water passing through you, you're not capturing it. And that water is useful. It makes the environment unified. You have water for usage, for irrigation. It's a resource. So capturing all the rooftops and being able to create water systems, yes. Very good point. That's a very good other point. Do you have any plan to uh, take these ideas in a form that would appeal to city folk, particularly devotees in the cities, in the city temples? Yes. Actually, we haven't developed yet. But part of our follow-up, as soon as we do the training, because we want to attract people. So someone is there, they don't even know if they like agriculture. But there's a course I did, I liked it. He came here, hey, a new candidate. So just having the platform and attracting people is one step. Once that's in place, for the city, urban, rural, link. The missing link. The urban, rural link. The tandem, right? The two, the bicycle, two seats, the urban rule. Someone on town, rich, retiring, retiring, says, Hey, I want to invest. We have opportunities. I have so many things you could invest in, and we'll give you back your investment. It's a good plan. Oh, I have I would like to buy land around Git and Agri. Sure. So you start developing, and then you can start with your agroforestry, with something for 20 years ahead. You pay back your investment. You do some development and it starts to be an investment fund now. Now you're talking people with money, rather than putting it on the back, they invest in your operations. For every euro which comes into New Brasilia, it becomes automatically free because they have an internal coin, the shop. What is the shop? Venom Maduro was working, serving here. So he's got a stipend. Let's say you give him like $500. But you wouldn't give him any more five hundred dollars. You give him two fifty only, and two fifty would be in Damodars. Damodars. Your Damodar coin, and Damodar coins buys local produce, buy dairy, milk, wood for eating his house. So now every dollar come in here has to be spent locally because he can't do anything with his Damodars except by local produce. So it retrofeeds your economy. It stops all your money from just going out in out so that's very smart and now the number of products is increasing there lavanda and spread and bean spread and this spread and that thing so ice cream so the children are crazy searching their dad's wallet for for shams to buy ice cream so this is another thing which you know a lot to be done so answer your question and csa is a perfect vehicle for this type of work Dinners, a pastor is doing dinners. They invite their partners to come for a dinner and show everything they're doing here. And people learn, people invite. That. Wow. Thank you, Ethan Agri. Uh, I think great job. My immense gratitude to all of you for doing this. And I do hope to work closer. And now we are in a more practical stage. Uh, this is a very practical stage. We've traveled enough, we've winged enough, now it's time to implement. So we're really looking for professionals who are implementers of this stage. Uh, and, and these professionals, we want to make available for the net. So that's our attempt. So if you know people interested, we have a form, interest form, so they feed the earth, they can care of research scouts. Why don't you help to put the word out so that people know there is a possibility to get more information, to get ready, it's going to be launched in Cartier. And then that's the first one. And then more news, exciting news for you coming on community design systems. 
It's going to be a very awesome course where we want to visit the Anush, the Mennonites, the Hadarites, a traditional Indian village in Gujarat, a kibbutz in Israel, a Yanomami tribe in Brazil, and then an eco village movement in Europe. And then extract principles that we can flush out in our Israel. So that's it'll be very exciting because the whole syllabus will develop on site and then we flush it out from real interactions with these communities. You know? So that's something to look up. All right. Thank you all very much. It's an immense pleasure again to be here. I should be getting ready for my next destination, New Brindavan. And I hope to be back here sometime. If you invite me, I'll come. <laughs> so if I'm invited, you have to give me something in progression. Your agroforestry has progressed. More free time for the farmers. <laughs> this is a nice time to interact. Okay, back to coming. Winter time will serve time. Oh, yes, it's a production. All right, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, you stay up for a year without catching up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From next year, I'll be more North American. I got an invitation to start doing something more consistent. That's why I'm. Oh, well, invitation has always been bring your family and spend it. Extend the time to come back. I'll think about that. But now that the girls are growing, yes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Shiro Prabhupada, KJ, Gordon, yeah. Melandi, Gitanagri, K. Thank you all. His voice kind of comes up a little too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, so we need some kind of change. Yeah, so you're sitting here. Yes, farmers are all shit. Thank you so much. Yes, farmers are all the same. I don't know if they're being changed. Both the side of the shit is just the same. Thank you.